October 28, 2015, the Cassini probe captures one of its final images of a mysterious moon orbiting Saturn. Its name, Enceladus. Its diameter is just 310 miles, less than 15% of our own moon. But these photos reveal what appear to be volcanic geysers spewing from its surface. Scientists are trained not to jump to conclusions. So we weren't going to say definitely we found, you know, we found something. We thought, you know, you know, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is, this is something really, really outstanding and something very significant. Why do these plumes exist? What is inside them? To me, it eclipses everything else we know about the other worlds in the solar system. This is the single most important and interesting place for our solar system beyond the Earth. Could this tiny ball of ice actually contain the ingredients necessary for life? In 1977, NASA launches two spacecraft on a 12-year journey to the outer edge of the solar system. The Voyager probes send back the first detailed images and data of the gas giants beyond the asteroid belt. But one planet captures the heart of Carolyn Porco. I was a graduate student when Voyager flew by Saturn. I did my thesis on Saturn's rings and it's, you know, like your first love. Of course, the, the jolt that we scientists get is, you know, finding something new that nobody else knows about. Um, and all that happened for me at Saturn. But one moon seems to hold more mysteries than the others. Covered in a thick orange atmosphere, its name is Titan. It was Titan, completely enshrouded in haze, and we didn't know when we got there with Voyager, whether or not we'd be able to see down to the surface and it, with our cameras, and it turned out we couldn't. Unable to see past the atmosphere, Voyager cannot solve the mystery of what lies beneath. Titan was an object of immense interest. This was the place that we need to go back to. So when NASA put out this announcement of opportunity saying, you know, come apply to be involved in our next adventures at Saturn, I applied and I'm, so grateful that I had the chutzpah to think, I'm not just gonna be a member of the imaging team, I'm gonna lead it. In 1990, Carolyn's dream comes true. NASA places her in charge of the imaging team for Cassini, and this mission will be different. Voyager, mind you, was a reconnaissance mission. It was just a flyby, and the whole purpose is just to see what's there in the brief period of time that you're allowed. But Cassini will enter Saturn's system and stay there for years, imaging the planet and its moons with high-powered cameras and scientific instruments. Three, two, one, and liftoff of the Cassini spacecraft on a billion-mile trek to Saturn. In July 2004, Cassini arrives at Saturn, and right away, it delivers on its promise, taking the most detailed images ever of the ringed planet and its moons. I had been thinking about Voyager imagery, and then I walk into my lab and I see this picture, and it's incredibly detailed. And I, that's when I thought, oh my God, this is gonna be just spectacular. This is gonna be a wondrous thing what we're gonna be doing at Saturn. The Cassini mission brought us a wealth of scientific discoveries about Saturn. For example, it helped discover four new moons. Cassini revealed entirely new detail about Saturn's amazing rings and the way that they are moving around the planet. Talk about an age of exploration.
Imagine sending an observatory out to Saturn to stay there for years. You don't even really know what you're going to discover, so you can hang around and even go back to places again and again to look for what's changing over time, to investigate things that you never knew were there until you actually got to Saturn. So when I think of Cassini, I think about these amazing pictures of this beautiful planet. There's nothing like Saturn to me that really evokes this poetic response, the, the sheer beauty of it. And we found so many amazing things. We learned about how giant planets operate. What we know about the rings now from Cassini being out there, I mean, it just completely changed our view of the most beautiful of the planets. But for astrobiologist Chris McKay, the real star of the show is Titan. The reason Titan was so interesting for astrobiology was that it is so rich in organics. There's an organic haze in the atmosphere. We thought that there would be organic liquids on the surface. Organics are the carbon-based molecules needed for life. Could organic liquids indicate some form of life on the surface of Titan? Carolyn and the team have equipped Cassini to do what Voyager could not, see beneath the haze. And it will happen by sending a probe called Huygens right down to the surface. So Huygens was designed to drop from the Cassini probe and descend through the atmosphere and make a soft landing on Titan, sending back information the whole way about what Titan was actually like and finally giving us a chance to peer through these murky clouds on the surface. On January 14th, 2005, Huygens makes its descent. When the Huygens probe descended through Titan's atmosphere on a parachute, it was taking images of the surface. We didn't know what to expect, but it showed what looked like shorelines. When we got pictures of the surface, it was very clear that there had been liquid of some kind on the surface for a long time. But Titan's surface is nearly minus 200 degrees Celsius, so that liquid cannot be water. So Titan has clouds, it has rain, it has rivers, it has seas, but it's methane and ethane. And the real question for astrobiology is, is there some sort of chemistry that could make life, that could live in this kind of liquid? For life to exist on Titan, it would have to be so alien that it survived on methane instead of water. Although Chris McKay is hopeful, it's a long shot. But Titan is not the only moon orbiting Saturn. Enceladus was a moon that we knew from Voyager was unique. It was the whitest object in the solar system. It was the brightest object in the solar system. It was associated with a very big ring of very, very fine smoke-sized particles that had been discovered around Saturn in the 1960s. Enceladus was the place that we were just puzzled about. And other than Titan, Enceladus was the moon that on Cassini we had planned to have the greatest number of flybys. Carolyn Porco turns her attention towards Enceladus. And once Cassini arrives, a single photograph transforms the entire mission. I was focused on Titan, but then my world changed. For me, it was really a oh my God moment. In February 2005, the Cassini space probe makes a shocking discovery on Saturn's icy moon, Enceladus. Some of the first images coming back from Enceladus are sort of centered on the moon itself, and there's not much space besides just the moon in the image. And if you look closely, there's kind of this whitish glow near the South Pole. And I can imagine people at first wondering, was that some trouble with the image? Did the calibration not go right? And then all of a sudden you realize, there's something coming out of that moon. Our first observation turned out to have something coming off the South Pole. And it was clear. Everybody just went all abuzz with this, like, wow, there's something coming off the South Pole. Everybody was getting excited. 
Scientists knew that the moons of Saturn were cold. And then they suddenly see these images of Enceladus and they noticed a kind of activity that you don't expect from some sort of cold, dead moon. The image shows a plume of material streaming miles above Enceladus. The Cassini team suspects that it's water somehow ejected by a powerful amount of heat and energy. Carolyn Porco immediately contacts Chris McKay with the news. Carolyn calls me up, I'm in a meeting, but I know if it's Carolyn, it's an important message, so I ducked out of the meeting and I listened to the phone call and I was stunned. And that's when I learned about all the interesting stuff coming back from Enceladus, evidence of energy coming from a subsurface ice environment. My world changed. The reason why this discovery mattered so much is that it meant that there might be an enormous amount of really interesting chemistry going on there. The kind of chemistry that might be similar to what we saw in the early days of the Earth, maybe replicating the kinds of conditions that might give rise to life. Our first thought was we gotta get a closer look, okay? And we gotta figure this thing out. A few months later, the probe makes another flyby of Enceladus. And this time, there's no mistaking the power hiding underneath the icy surface of this moon. And that's when we really had our, you know, our socks blown off, because that's the picture where you see about a dozen narrow jets coming off the South Pole. We found out that heat was coming from these four fractures. But what is producing something so extreme? Scientists believe the gravitational forces of Saturn are tugging on Enceladus, creating friction inside the moon. The evidence indicates Enceladus has massive amounts of water and a powerful source of energy, two key ingredients in the search for life. If you've ever spent any time by the ocean, you know about tides. On Earth, the water rises and falls you know, a couple times a day, and that has to do with the gravity of the sun and the moon actually tugging on the Earth, kind of stretching the planet. Now, in the outer solar system, you have some big planets. You know, Saturn is on the order of 95 times the mass of the Earth, so there's a lot of gravity there. And some of Saturn's moons actually orbit very, very close in to that planet. So there's tidal forces. And so these moons are stretched and pulled back and forth. And friction is simple. You, know, you, you rub your hands together and you can feel the warmth. The rocks sliding back and forth, being stretched by the tides, generates heat. In fact, enough heat that underneath the ice, you get liquid water, lots of it. And how else could a little moon like Enceladus, so far out from the sun, part of the outer solar system, how could it be warm enough to have liquid water? It's the tides that warms the interior of Enceladus. And the next step is, can we say something from the molecules we see about the conditions of what's going on in the subsurface? Can we say anything about the presence of biology? Can we see anything that could be consistent with biology? The team looks to find signs of organic material in the plumes. And what Cassini finds provides even more evidence that the building blocks of life may be brewing underneath the icy surface. We have found that the particles in the plume close to the surface were salty, and they had a salinity comparable to the Earth's oceans. And that said that this body of water had to be under the ice shell and in contact with a core in contact with a rocky core. It could be an environment similar to hydrothermal vents at the bottom of Earth's oceans, a place where life exists. So all of this put together said that we had a zone that could possibly sustain life. Okay, had the basic ingredients. It doesn't mean it has the secondary and tertiary ingredients, but could it possibly be a place where, you know, if biological activity is not taking place now, it might be well on its way to taking place. Over the next several years, Cassini continues to gather data and photos from Enceladus and its plumes. But in December 2015, after 10 years of flybys, 
Cassini approaches Enceladus for the last time. Carolyn and Chris are among the first people to see the final images. This is the last flyby of Enceladus by Cassini. These are the last close-ups. That's right. Are you strapped in? Here we go. Look, oh my oh. God. What are oh, those are just craters, but look at them. It's incredible, isn't it? Really nice. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. We're going to be working with this now to find Seth for a long time. Oh, very long time. I, be, I mean, Cassini's been so incredibly rich. I, you know, it'll be, I, be, I bet we'll be working with Cassini data for 50 years. But this final pass by Cassini doesn't study the plumes on Enceladus. If scientists are going to continue looking for signs of life, a new probe will have to go back because in September 2017, Cassini will end its mission and plunge into the atmosphere of Saturn. For scientists who are looking for possibilities of life in the outer solar system, seeing these jets on Enceladus, this is winning the World Series and the Super Bowl all rolled into one. This is the, the best possible discovery they could make. Imagine being one of those planetary scientists where you just have your universe stood on its head. You go out to the outer solar system expecting things to be frozen solid. You're so far away from the sun, you know, where are you gonna get the heat? And all of a sudden now you realize that underneath the ice of Enceladus, there is a lot of liquid water, an ocean's worth. And it even looks very interesting. There's neat chemistry in the water. So this may be one of the best places to look for life. Your entire career has just been changed. Sometimes the universe just does you a favor. Enceladus, in some ways, is kind of the holy grail of looking for life. Because you know that there is warm liquid water. You know that there's interesting organic chemistry in the water. But there's nowhere else in the solar system where that water is flying out in geysers that are hundreds of miles tall, which means you can fly your spacecraft right through it. The universe delivers the sample right to us. Nowhere else in the solar system do you know that there is a vent of liquid water coming out right here. So we could send a lander to actually land near one of these geysers, maybe even go down one of the vents. That's why Dr. Porco and her team are determined to return with a new spacecraft. We're not sure that there's life there. We just have strong indications that there is at least an environment there that could support life, and maybe even an environment where life might have originated. So the thing that many of us want to do is we want to go back and, if at all possible, eventually bring back a sample to Earth. To me, it eclipses everything else we know about the other worlds in the solar system. This is the single most important and interesting place for astrobiology in our solar system beyond the Earth. Can you tell I'm enthusiastic about it? 